We like easy. We like convenient. And so the title of my lesson today is The Bible Made Easy. Let me explain. There's a sense in which the Bible is easy, and then there's a sense in which it is hard. You know, the, the Apostle <clears throat> Peter said this of his peer, the Apostle Paul, in 2 Peter chapter 3. He wrote, just count the patience of our Lord of salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks of them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does Peter say there? That there are some things in Paul's writings that are a little harder to understand than other things are. And he also says that some people take things that Paul wrote and twist them around to suit their own fanciful ideas. We've actually been studying this uh, on Wednesday nights in our class here in the auditorium. But he says that they also do this with many other scriptures, so it's not just limited to Paul's writings. So he warns people of, uh, you know, warn, warns of people like this, and he, he exhorts his readers to grow in the grace and knowledge that can be found in the revelation of Christ. So, you know, on the one hand, the Bible is hard. On the other hand, the Bible is not hard. It is not some great mystery. You know, all the mysteries have, in fact, been revealed in Christ. A couple of weeks ago, Luke spoke of the word mystery in the Bible and did a great job of uh, talking about that, I refer you to that message. But God's word can be read and, and it can be understood and it can be applied to life today and it can be lived out faithfully as a result of that. Part of the key to doing that, I think, is to have a grasp of the big picture, the overall message, the, the overarching storyline. Fancy people call it the meta-narrative of Scripture. To have an idea of that big story and then reading the rest of the Bible in light of that. You know, sometimes people get intimidated by, by the Bible. You know, they see it has 66 books. Um, it has many hundreds of pages. They, they might see the small print or all the chapter and verse numbers or the footnotes and, and, and cross-references and so forth, and it can overwhelm them. Uh, they, they read sentences that seem long and complex and unrelatable, perhaps. This happened also to Bible characters. It's interesting that uh, Jason referred to the individual that I want to as well here for a moment, uh, this man. In, in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian that Philip studied with and eventually baptized. He's reading the scriptures as, as we were told and he's reading in the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, in fact, as he rides along in the chariot. Philip comes alongside of him and asks him, as we heard in, in verse 30, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I unless someone explain it to me or someone guides me? You see, he felt like he needed some help, like he needed assistance. Nothing wrong with that at all, you know, to ask for help. That's why we have Bible study. That's why we have times 
regularly where we come together and, and talk about the scripture and read it and study it. That's why part of the reason we have sermons and, and maybe smaller group Bible studies and things like that to teach, to guide, to help one another understand God's word. The point is this. Sometimes we just need to understand in a short, clear, concise statement what the Bible's all about. Is that possible? Uh, in a sense, can we make the Bible easy? Yes, we can. And, and I'm convinced that several times throughout this book, God inspired his writers to capture the basic message of Scripture in a few short, simple words. And uh, in, in the remaining time, the next few minutes, I want us to look cl closely at one of those places. If you ever wondered, what's the book all about? What's the Bible all about? What's Christianity all about? This is it in a nutshell, in two short verses. And I'm referring to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. If you want to look at that text, we'll also project it here. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. Let's hear it. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That, folks, is what it is all about. This book... This faith that we share, the Bible is, is summed up here and, and sort of distilled down to its essentials in just two verses. Let's take a, a bit of a closer look at what is written here. A writer, of course, is Paul. He's writing to Christians in the ancient Greek city of Corinth. And of all the churches that Paul worked with, at least that we know of, this one probably gave him more fits than any other, the church in Corinth. He wrote them at least four letters. We only have two of them in Scripture, but he refers to a couple of others. And we know that he visited them on multiple occasions. Some of those visits were unpleasant, he says. The problem at this particular point where we read is that there's some, well, let's call them big talkers who are trying to take over the Corinthian church. Big talkers sometimes try to do that. And they're questioning Paul's authority. Paul had special, unique authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ in the first century. And these big talkers were challenging his authority. Sometimes people do that. And uh, these, whoever they were, they're powerful, uh, they're influential, they seem to be great speakers, great public speakers, great orators. They're also very arrogant, and they're, they're promoting themselves, and they're boastful. And Paul is trying to remind the Christians what it means to be a Christian. He talks about humility. He talks about self-sacrifice and, and those kinds of important attributes. Well, in the midst of this argument of Paul against his detractors and challengers and opponents at Corinth lies this gem of a passage that we just read. And, and I think, I really believe if we get what Paul said in these two verses, verses 14 and 15, will be a long way down the road toward understanding what the Bible as a whole is all about. And we'll be better prepared to read it with confidence. If you begin to read the Bible with the message of these two verses in mind, 
it'll make a lot more sense to you. Paul here is talking about the motives for all of his preaching and teaching, what he was doing. He's talking about Jesus' death and the response that it creates in his people. So look again at what he says, verse 14. It begins, the love of Christ controls us. Some translations say compels us or constrains us. And I think here Paul is referring to the love Christ has demonstrated toward us. Not our love for him, but his love for us. When he says the love of Christ. So the love Christ has for us, Paul says, controls us. It's an interesting word there, controls. It's not very common in the New Testament it means literally to hold in one's grip or one's grasp. Have you, ever, have you ever shaken hands with somebody and immediately wished you hadn't? Um, they tried to crush your hand. You ever experienced that before? I mean, I like a firm handshake too, but too much of a good thing is bad. I have a relative that uh, does this. You know, whenever he shakes your hand. And, and so I've got through the years to, when I see him coming, you know, holidays and so forth, I sort of brace myself for the hand. You know, if I, I'm ready for that shake. I'm trying to give it back just as good as I get it. But this word means to, to compel, to control, to urge. Paul says Christ's love controls us. Because of the love of, of Christ, we're in his grip, his control. So is Christ's love such a reality in your life that it in fact controls you, that it compels you? Are you in his divine grip? Well, Paul was, certainly. And, and this is what he envisioned for the church in Corinth and what God wants for us. This is how he wants us to live and conduct ourselves. I know it's not fashionable in, in our culture, in our world, to give control of our lives to anyone or anything. But that's really what a Christian is called to do. To loosen our own grip and give Christ control. It's often said this way, to, to let go and let God. Paul says, I can't help but do what I'm doing because Christ's love controls me. Now, if someone might, might ask, why would anyone choose to give up control of their own lives? Why would they do that? He goes on in verse 14 to say this. Because we have concluded this. See, so he's going to give us the reason. Paul had made a decision in his life. God will not take control if you don't want him to. You have to decide. He's not going to reach down, take you in his grip, and, and start directing your steps in opposition to your will. He's not going to do that. You have to decide. You have to decide to follow him. Paul had made that decision in his life. He was convinced. He had come to a conclusion about this thing. What is it that he had concluded? What had he decided? He says, verse 14, We have concluded that one has died for all. So here's one of the keys to understanding what the Bible's all about. This phrase right here. One has died for all. God created us. I say us, I mean mankind. 
He created us in purity and goodness and in a close relationship with him. That was the original state. He intended it to be that way forever. But mankind broke with God. Mankind broke God's rules, sinned, and therefore broke that relationship. God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, because on that day you will surely die. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Leap ahead into the New Testament. Romans 6, verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. That means sin's cost is death. God said, if you do this thing, you will surely die. Paul writes in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. It was then, it still is today. So for God to be honest and just, and he always is, sinners must pay the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? Death. Death. But if we die for our sins, how can we be with God for eternity? Well, God had a plan, and his plan was that one die for all. His plan was that the perfect one, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, his only son, would die in our place. He would die our death. You see, that satisfies the justice of God. That makes God honest and true to his word. It takes care of the punishment that needs to be meted out for sin. Even though Jesus didn't deserve the punishment because he didn't sin, we did. Why did he do that? Because he loves us, for God so loved the world. The love of Jesus controlled Jesus and what he did. He loves us. He wants the best for us. Why did one die for all? Because of the love of Christ. What controls the Christian? The love of Christ. What is the love of Christ? One died for all. Paul says, one died for all, therefore all have died. What's that getting at? All those who have made the same decision that Paul did to let Christ's love control him. All those who have done that have died to their old way of living. That's the death of repentance. Romans chapter 6 says we die with Christ and we're buried with him in baptism. And then we're raised up just like Christ was raised up, to a new life, to a life now controlled by God, controlled by the love of Christ. How do we live then? Well, Paul tells us in verse 15. He says, And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. We live now for Christ. We live for his body, the church. How could we do otherwise? He died for us. How could we do anything else? Shouldn't we be controlled by that? How many of our employers ever died for us? How many of our teachers ever died for us? How many 
of our coaches. All these people do great things for us. How many ever died for us? How many of our entertainers, our heroes, ever died for us? Yet the question is, who is more in control of us? Paul says, I can't help but do what I do. Go read Paul's life. And you wonder, how could he do what he did? Paul says, I can't help it. I'm in God's grip. I'm in the grip of his grace. These two verses are truly the the gospel in miniature. And and the more you understand and remember them, and I would suggest you memorize these verses, inscribe them in your mind, the more you you understand these verses, the Bible's going to make a lot more sense to you as you read it. This book will not be some dry, crumpled heirloom with dust all over it on your shelf when, when you get the message of these verses, but it will indeed be a living presence in your life. When you read the the first book in it, when you read the book of Genesis, for instance, it's no longer going to be just a bunch of interesting, though sometimes odd, stories. But instead, it's going to be the story of God setting his plan in motion to save you. Through people like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Even a book like Leviticus. Have you got to Leviticus yet in your resolution to read the Bible through in a year? That's that's the speed bump a lot of times. The book of Leviticus. But Leviticus, even that book full of strange laws and commands that so much of it doesn't seem like it's relevant to, to me personally, You can see that as God protecting his people, wanting to be in relationship with them, and then pointing them to the coming of his son by emphasizing that life is in the blood. And Revelation, the last book that intimidates so many, Revelation will suddenly become the book proclaiming the victory that Christ has won for you because of his love and telling you about your future. That's what it's all about. For the love of Christ controls us Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The Bible made easy. I hope the love of Christ is really controlling you. You have great reason to worship this morning if that's the case. And if it's not the case, you have great reason this morning to change. And you're invited to make whatever change needs to be made. Whether in yourself or or before this body, maybe to be baptized into Christ as we talked about. To obey the gospel of Jesus. Why would you do such a thing? Because the love of Christ controls us. And why would you go out and share this good news with someone this week? Because his love controls us. This is the reason we're doing what we're doing. This morning, if you need to make a change or just ask for help or 
or prayer, whatever it might be. We give you this time to respond while we stand and sing.